Good day, Dr. Cruz. We are Group 7 and we will be representing a case about laryngeal cancer. So I am Clerk An Ocampo Ana Francesca and I will be reporting on the patient's history. Here are uh, the list of our group members. So this is the case of JN, a 55-year-old male, married, who works as a construction worker, Filipino, Roman Catholic, born on April 1, 1965 at Quezon City and is currently residing in Barangay Marulas, Valenzuela City. He consulted for the first time at our institution on November 7, 2020. So our patient came in with a chief complaint of hoarseness. Symptoms, uh, symptoms started four months prior to consultation when patient had sudden intermittent hoarseness with no other associated symptoms noted, such as fever, sore throat, dyspnea, dysphagia, and hemoptysis. Patient did not take any medication and no consultation was done. Three months prior to consultation, there was persistence of intermittent hoarseness and there was noted foreign body sensation in his throat, which was really relieved by constant throat clearing. Still with no other associated symptoms such as fever, dyspnea, dysphagia, hemoptysis, patient did not note, uh, did not take medication and no consultation was done. Two months prior to consultation, the symptoms persi still persisted. However, the patient started experiencing throat pain with a pain scale of 5 out of 10 with a localized burning sensation which is aggravated by swallowing of food and relieved by gargling of warm water with salt. Patient had no associated symptoms such as fever, dyspnea, dysphagia, and hemoptysis. No medication was taken and no consultation was done. One month prior to consultation, there was still the persistence of symptoms and the throat pain increased from a pain scale of 5 out of 10 to 7 out of 10 still with the localized burning, burning sensation, which is aggravated by swallowing of food and relieved by gargling of warm water with salt. Patient had no associated symptoms like fever, dyspnea, dysphagia, and hemoptysis. Patient did not take any medication and no consultation was done. One week prior to consultation, the persistence of symptoms are now associated with dyspnea, which was aggravated when doing household chores and work and was relieved by rest. No other associated symptoms such as fever and hemoptysis were noted. No medication was taken and no consultation was done. Until one day prior to consultation, there was still persistence of symptoms now associated with productive cough with blood-stained mucus. Due to the persistence of symptoms, patient sought consult at Fatima University Medical Center. For the, next, for the past medical history, the patient claims to have childhood immunizations against polio, pertussis, and tetanus. Patient claims to have no hypertension, diabetes mellitus, coronary artery disease, bronchial asthma, and pulmonary tuberculosis. Pa patient denies any food allergies, uh, allergies to medications or any psychiatric problem. There is no previous blood transfusion, surgery, or any hospitalization. For the family history, patient denies having heredofamilial diseases such as hypertension, diabetes mellitus, coronary artery disease, bronchial asthma, pulmonary tuberculosis, or malignancy. And for the uh, personal and social history, our patient is a cigarette, cigarette smoker with uh, 14 pack years, smoking 10 sticks per day. He is also an alcoholic beverage drinker, drinking 8 bottles of beer per day. Lastly, he denies history of any illicit drug use. Good afternoon. I'm Clerk Naboa Jorel, and I will report about the review of system and part of the physical examination. For the re review of system, Review of system were unremarkable.
Next slide, please. For the physical examination, general survey, the patient is conscious, coherent, well-nourished, well-developed, no gross deformity, with hoarseness with hoarseness in speech, with good gait and posture, ambulatory, a febrile, and does not appear to be in cardiorespiratory distress. Vital signs, patient's blood pressure is 120 over 80 millimeter mercury, heart rate is 90 beats per minute, respiratory rate is 17 cycles per minute, temperature is 36.7 degrees Celsius, and O2, O2 saturation is 96%. Anthropometric measurement, the patient's height is 167.6 centimeters and the patient's weight is 63.6 kilogram with a body mass index of 22 kilogram per meter square, which is normal. For the skin, the skin is brown in color, warm to touch, smooth with good mobility and turgor and no active lesions. Hair is black, smooth, and well distributed. The nails are clean and pinkish with capillary refill of less than two seconds and no cyanosis or clubbing noted. For the head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat, head is symmetrical, normocephalic, no deformity, no masses, no tenderness noted. The temporal artery is palpable but not visible. Hair is black, abundant, well distributed, and smooth. The scalp is movable along with the cranium and no parasites noted. The face is oval, symmetric, with no abnormal facial expression. The skin is brown and smooth with no lesions and no abnormal facial movement. Next, please. The eyes. The eyebrows are black, smooth, evenly distributed on both sides. Eyelids have no swelling, no lesion, no ptosis. Conjunctiva is pinkish with no edema, discharge, and lesion. The sclera is white, transparent cornea, no opacity, no lesion. The brown iris and the pupil is 3 to 4 millimeter in size, equally round, reactive to light, and has intact visual field. Next. For the external ear examination, there is no tragal tenderness, discharge, impacted serumen, hyperemia, masses, and lesions in both ears. Next. Otoscopic examination, there is presence of cone of light with intact tympanic membrane and no perfusion, perforation, sclerosis, bulging or retraction, hypermobility or hypomobility, and hyperemia in both ears. Next. Anterior rhinoscopy, the, the nostrils are patent. There are no discharge, deviation, masses, lesions, congested tubernates, foruncle, and polyps noted. Next, the oral cavity, the uvula is in midline and the tongue is also in midline upon protrusion. There is no hyperemia, trismus noted. Patient has complete set of teeth with no caries, abnormal staining, gingivitis, deformities, and malocclusion noted. Next. Next, please. Good afternoon. I am Clerk Obispo. So for the transillumination test, both the frontal and maxillary sinuses are positive for transillumination. Trans for the Weber test, sound is heard equal bilaterally. And for the Rhine's test, air conduction is greater than bone conduction. And this shows that the patient has no hearing loss. Next, please. For indirect laryngoscopy, it showed exophytic mass located at the left glottic area with erythematous arytenoids noted. 
but vocal cords are not fully visualized. While for the direct laryngoscopy, it is irregular exophytic mass located at the left glottic area involving the vocal cords. Normal findings on the posterior pharyngeal wall and areas with piriform tissue. Next slide, please. For the head and neck, again, the trachea is in the midline with no gross deformities, no lymph adenopathy, masses, lesions, and facial asymmetry noted. For the physical examination, the chest and lungs, cardiovascular, abdomen, spine and extremities, neurologic are all unremarkable. So for the salient features, again, our patient is a 55-year-old male with a chief complaint of hoarseness with foreign body sensation on the throat, adenophagia, dysphagia, dyspnea, hemoptysis noted, smoker 14 pack years, and an alcoholic beverage drinker. For the indirect laryngoscopy, it showed again exophytic mass located at the left glottic area with erythematous arytenoids noted, but the vocal cords are not fully visualized. For the direct laryngoscopy, it has irregular exophytic mass located at the left glottic area now involving the vocal cords. So we came up to our clinical impression to consider laryngeal carcinoma left glottic area. Uh, I am Clerk Ocampo, Abigail Clarice, and I will be uh, reporting about um, a part of differential diagnosis. So our first differential diagnosis is laryngeal paraganglioma. So this is um, a paragangliomas of the larynx that are neuroendocrine neoplasms that arise from either the superior or inferior laryngeal paraganglia. So um, we ruled it in because um, a patient presents was presented with um, hoarseness, dyspnea, dysphagia, hemoptysis, adenophagia, and there is mass on glottic area. However, it was ruled out because there is no um, palpable neck mass on which um, patients with laryngeal paraganglioma are commonly presented with. There is also no paralysis of the ipsilateral through vocal cord. There is no Horner syndrome, no neuropathies of cranial nerves 9, 11, and 12, and um, the mass is well circ circumscribed in the laryngeal paraganglioma on which the patient presented with an irregular mass. Next is the laryngeal tuberculosis. So the co most common presentation of patients with this um, um, disease is hoarseness on which um, present on the patient. Um, so ruled it in because there is hoarseness, dyspnea, dysphagia, odinophagia, and there is an exophytic mass. However, it was ruled out because um, there is no active pulmonary disease mentioned um, and active um, PTB was, um, um, brings um, a high risk factor to have this disease. Um, there is also no dysphonia, no cough and weight loss. Good afternoon. I am Krug Tantaliti Nantapon. I also discussed with differential diagnosis with laryngeal amyloidosis. This is amyloid deposit in tissue, especially in respiratory organ. It's low in with patient present hoarseness, cough, hemoptysis, steatol, dyspnea, and smoking but we rule out because laryngeal amyloidosis is most common in younger and patient did not have any systemic disease and no multiple and no multi-organ involvement and no familiar syndromes, no pulmonary disease patients. The mass didn't show with slow calling mass and didn't show yellow list white mass Next, please. The next is vocal cord poly. It is benign of vocal cord. It looks in with patient present with throat pain, hoarseness, diphonia, and smoking. The mass present with unilateral side are located throughout the cortex, but it blew out because no vocal fault hemolytic. 
no gastroesophageal reflux that make the vocal cord irritate and patient did not have excessive voice and no witness presence next please Good afternoon, I'm Clerk Nolasco, Jezzeri Ain, and now we will proceed for the discussion. So first, we, uh, we discuss anatomy of the larynx. Larynx is a hollow tube organ, uh, continuous with the trachea below and pharynx above in the anterior compartment of the neck. It forms the narrowest point in the respiratory tract between the nasopharynx and trachea, making it particularly susceptible to obstructions. So for the anatomic region, the laryngeal cavity is divided into three parts in relation to the glottis. We have three, the supraglottis, glottis, and subglottis. Uh, for the supraglottis, it is bounded by the tip of epiglottis up to the level of the vocal cord. Uh, glottis is at the level of true vocal cord to one centimeter below it. Subglottis is one centimeter below the glottis up to the level of inferior border of cricoid cartilage. So for the supporting structures, next. Next slide, please. Uh, the laryngeal skeletal structure is composed of one bone, which is the hyoid bone, a U-shaped structure that can be palpated both anteriorly in the neck and transorally in the lateral pharyngeal wall, and also several paired and unpaired cartilages. And these car uh, laryngeal cartilages begin to ossify at about 20 years. For the unpaired laryngeal cartilages, we have three. So the thyroid cartilage, uh, cricoid, and the epiglot epiglottis. So, uh, thyroid cartilage is the largest shield-like structure. It is a two laminae of hyaline cartilages that meet in the midline, which we call the Adam's apple. The cricoid cartilage is shaped like a signet ring. The, it is the only com complete ring and site for emergency. It is located below the thyroid cartilage. It encircles the subglottis like a ring and imparting a mechanical stability that helps to prevent collapse of the laryngeal skeleton. And the epiglottis, it is function as a keel, Forcing swallow food to the side of the laryngeal airway, it is attached to the inner surface of the anterior bound art of the thyroid cartilage. And for the paired laryngeal cartilages, uh, we have the arytenoid uh, shaped like three-sided pyramid and also the insignificant or with no functions two small paired accessory cartilages which are the corniculate and the cuneiform. So we also have the quadrigal quadrangular membrane and the conus elasticus. Uh, quadrangular membrane is attached anteriorly to the lateral margin of the epiglottis and curves posteriorly to attach to the arytenoid and corniculate cartilages. The conus elasticus is a dense fibroconnective tissue that connects the cricoid cartilage to the thyroid and arytenoid cartilages. So the importance of these two, the quadrangular ligament or membrane plus the conus elasticus is a strong oncologic division between the supraglottis and glottis. It also protects the glottis from the carcinoma approaching from the vestibule. Next slide, slide please. For the laryngeal musculature, so we divided this into two groups, and these are the extrinsic and intrinsic muscles. For the extrinsic, the function of this is to move larynx grossly as a whole. We have depressors and uh, elevators. For the depressors, uh, it is in the front of the laryngeal musculature, or we also uh, call this as uh, strap muscles. It composed of omohyoid, sternhyoid, and sternothyroid. And the elevators composed of uh, uh, mylohyoid, genohyoid, genoglossus, hyoglossus, digastric, stylohyoid, and thyrohyoid. And next slide, please. For the intrinsic muscles, this is for the movement of the vocal folds. So the abductor uh, moves folds away from each other, and it composes of posterior cricoarytenoid, and the adductors functions as uh, it pulls cords to close aperture. 
uh, uh, this composed of interarthenoid, lateral cricoarthenoid, and cricothyroid. Lastly, the tensors, uh, the cricothyroid, vocalis, and thyroarthenoid. Uh, we should take note that cricothyroid are, uh, is both an adductor and tensor. Next slide, please. For the innervation, the larynx and the trachea derive their motor and sensory innervation from the superior laryngeal nerve and recurrent laryngeal nerve, both of which arise from the vagus nerve or cranial nerve 10, which is the longest cranial nerve. So for the uh, superior laryngeal nerve, it is primarily sensory and it supplies motor function to only one muscle, which is the cricothyroid. And this is for the external branch. Well, the internal branch is sensory to supraglottis or above the vocal cord area. Uh, the second is the inferior or recurrent laryngeal nerve, a uh, motor to rest of intrinsic laryngeal muscles except cricothyroid, and sensory to sub subglottis or below the vocal cord area. Next slide, please. For the vascular supply, uh, we have the superior laryngeal artery which travels with the internal branch of superior laryngeal nerve and the inferior laryngeal artery travels with recurrent or inferior laryngeal nerve. And lastly, for the lymphatic drainage, uh, the lymphatic drainage is important for the cancer therapy. Uh, the area above the vocal folds, which is the lymphatic drainage along the superior laryngeal artery, is to the deep cervical nodes. And area below the vocal folds is the lymphatic drainage along the inferior thyro thyroid artery to the sub subclavian nodes. We should also take note that glottic, uh, here cancer does not metastasize quickly, so we don't need for surgery in this area. Next slide, please. Um, I'm, I'm Clerk Nemenya Steffi Heidezi, and I'll be discussing the physiology of the larynx. So for the, uh, the larynx serves three main functions. The phonation and speech that involves the fundamental note produced by vibration of the vocal cords. The next is the respiratory passage. <laughs> so the larynx is part of the upper respiratory tract which determines the resistance to airflow. Next is deglutition. So during deglutition, the larynx moves up towards the base of the tongue and thus brings the pharyngeosophageal junction closer to the bolus. The sphincter of the larynx prevents the passage of the food into the laryng laryngotracheobronchial tree. So it also plays an important role in the cough reflex. Next, please. For the etiology of laryngeal cancer, uh, malignancy tumors of the upper respiratory tract are 95% squamous cell carcinomas and mainly due to exposure to exogenous carcinogens, primarily tobacco, which contains polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and nitroso compounds and aromatic amines as its principal mutagens. Alcohol abuse also has great significance. Industrial agents such as soot, tar, nickel, and heat are also potential cause of laryngeal cancer. And asbestos exposure is considered as an occupational risk factor. Next, please. So the recent studies from the fourth edition of the World Health Organization classification of head and neck tumors deemed that Exposure to high-risk human papilloma virus also may increase the risk of developing not just tumors in the oral cavity, but in the larynx as well, particularly HPV-16. Malignant transformation is more common in adults with human papilloma virus. Next. For the carcinogenesis, in the upper respiratory tract is considered a multi-step process. So these carcinogens cause epithelial in injury that evoke an epithelial response consisting of hyperplasia and hyperkeratosis. So if there is continuous exposure to these nauseous agents, the possibility the, of the fossa of epithelial dysplasia will develop, spread, and progress to carcinoma in situ. 
So if this happens, it becomes irreversible. Next is the inside lesion penetrates the basement membrane, becoming an invasive cancer with metastatic potential. Next, please. So in this image, it just shows from the normal epithelium with continuous exposure to noxious agents, um, there will be dysplasia, and this shows the st different stages of dysplasia, a development of dysplasia to carcinoma in situ, and, and becoming an invasive carcinoma. Next, please. For the common signs and symptoms of laryngeal cancer are progressive continuous, continuous hoarseness, dyspnea and stridor, pain, dysphagia, and swelling in the neck. Um, next, please. Other symptoms of malignancies are foreign body sensation, habitual throat clearing, respiratory distress, and hemoptysis. So it depends on the location and extent of the tumor. So in glottic malignancies, most common initial symptoms is change of voice or hoarseness, even with the, when the tumor is still small. So that is why it is possible to be diagnosed at an early stage. However, in subglottic tumor, it may remain silent for some time, and its cardinal symptoms are dyspnea and inspiratory stridor. And in our patient, um, he experienced hoarseness, and this may be due to the interference with the vibration of the vocal cords, approximation of the vocal cords or their movements. And in our patient, it also um, the hoarseness persists for four months. Uh, our patient also experienced dyspnea that uh, may occur when there is a structural change in the larynx, like an obstructive lesion. He also experienced this, uh, dysphagia and odynophagia, and that may occur if there is a supraglottic tumors, particularly when involving the aripiglottic folds. Next slide, please. For the premalignant lesions, these are the epithelial changes that may give rise to carcinoma. First is the leukoplakia. It is a whitish spot, whitish patch of mucus cosa that cannot be rubbed away. It may be circumscribed or diffuse. However, it is not reliable for benign and malignant differentiation. Next, please. Next is erythroplakia. It is a reddish non-keratinized epithelial lesion that strongly suggests malignant transformation. Carcinoma in situ may already be present. It was uh, mentioned a while ago uh, in indirect laryngoscopy, our patient has uh, erythematous arytenoid. Next, please. Pachydermia is an area of epithelial thickening and may be completely, completely covered by keratin scales. Next. So for the pathology and epidemiology, I am Nalasco Marie Lauren. Um, laryngeal carcinoma is the most common malignancy of the head and neck. In the Philippines, um, a 2015 study of the Philippine Cancer Facts and Estimates said that the incidence of laryngeal carcinoma starts at age 50 years old among males, which is present in our um, patient, and 70 years old among women. It is the 17th most common cancer for both sexes, 10th most common among men, and 21st most common among women. Um, it is a malignancy that may be prevented and treated. And in 2015, there were 542 male and 154 female deaths due to laryngeal carcinoma. Next slide, please. So um, the site of occurrences of laryngeal carcinoma, so we have superglottic, glottic, and subglottic. So these are the three main divisions of the larynx. The superglottic area of the larynx is abundant with lymph nodes. Therefore, involvement of lymph nodes is the hallmark of laryngeal cancer in the subglottic sub region. Um, there, are 40 there is a 40% likelihood of a tumor arising from this area. And for the glottic part, where the true vocal cords are located, it has 60% likelihood of occurrence. Although it, um, this area has very few lymphatic drainages, therefore metastasis is not common and would develop in the later part of the disease progression. 
For the subglutic area of the larynx, there is only 1% chance for a laryngeal carcinoma to take place. Next slide, please. So for the histology, the most common type of laryngeal malignancy is a well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma or SCC. Other variants of laryngeal carcinoma would comprise of a verrucous carcinoma, sarcomatoid carcinoma, and neuroendocrine carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinomas comprise of 95% of all laryngeal cancers. Most often, it arises from a mucosal squamous dysplasia or car carcinoma in situ and typically presents islands, tongues, and clusters of atypical cells invading the laryngeal stroma. This, it also has features like keratinization, intracellular bridges, and keratin pearls. Next slide, please. So the subtypes of squamous cell carcinoma are um, verrucous SEC, spindle SEC, and basalite SEC. For the verrucous SEC, um, it presents in 1 to one to 4% of cases and does not metastasize to the original lymph nodes. Surgery is the treatment modality of choice, which um, since it is um, seen that radiotherapy does not show promising results. For um, the an another type is the spindle type of SEC. This type has a mass that is less endophytic. When accompanied by ulceration, this type is hard to identify as it is composed of pleomorphic spindle cells related with typical in situ or an invasive type, a very aggressive type wherein radiotherapy is also deemed ineffective and surgery is a definitive treatment. And the last is the basaloid type. Since in advanced stages where neck metastasis is already present, it is characterized as nests and lobules of small basaloid cells with a high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio that is well differentiated. Stromal hyalinosis and comedonecrosis are usually present. So radiotherapy and surgery of the primary tumor is usually the best treatment of choice for this type. It is important that we know the type of um, squamous cell carcinoma the patient has as it, each type will take a different course into the advanced stage. Therefore, our treatment of the patient will also change. Next, please. Okay, I'm Claire Tinami, Tripancoson, and I'll be presenting the diagnostic approach. From the complete history and PE we took from the patient, he is suspected to have laryngeal cancer at left glottic area. After the laryngoscopic examination in PE, the next diagnostic approach for us is to perform CT scan of larynx for TMN staging. If the information is not enough from CT scan, MRI can be done to provide extra information needed for TMN staging. Uh, finding from our history and PE and the expected information in each diagnostic approaches. So from the indirect laryngoscopy, um, there was an exophytic mass located at the left glottic area with erythematous arytenoids. Vocal cord was not visualized yet. And in direct laryngoscopy, so there was an irregular exophytic mass located at left glottic area involving the vocal cords. And there was a normal finding on posterior pharyngeal wall and area with piriform tissue. From the biopsy, uh, we take biopsy from laryngoscopy. We usually use um, spray anesthesis to stabilize the muscle movement while taking the biopsy. Um, it can determine and confirm the cancer, give pathologic staging, and give type of cancer present, whether it is likely to be fast growing or slow growing. And we use CD scan with contrast. It is the most preferred diagnostic, determining the submucosal tumor extension, status of cervical nodal diseases, metastasis, and other synchronous malignancy used for TMN staging. And, it, and CT scan with contrast is best done before the biopsy to avoid confusing tumor extent from edema that we um, do from biopsy. For MRI, it is used as 
a complementary problem solving tool when CT scan does not provide information needed for stagings. Okay, this is the staging of laryngeal cancers. Next, please. Okay, extra tests recommended to determine patient's general condition, metastasis, possibility of second primary tumor. Um, we can request CBC, platelet count, urinalysis, chemistry study, and complete liver function tests, thyroid function tests and scans if there is a suspect mass in thyroid, and ultrasonography to determine the regional metastasis, and chest radiograph following CD. Uh, chest CT scan if metastatic lesion or second primary lesion is suspected. And if patient complains of bone pain, bone scan uh, for metastasis can be done and cardiac evaluations like ECG and blood clot clotting studies like partial thrombin time and prothrombin times and CT scan of surrounding area if there's a need of surgery for surgical planning to determine the extent of resectability. I'm Clerk Nemenya Alpha, and I will be discussing the management for laryngeal carcinoma. Next, please. So in the management of laryngeal carcinoma, TNM classification or staging is very important since this will be used in planning the proper treatment of the patient. And aside from that, we should also consider the age, comorbidities, the type of laryngeal carcinoma, as well as the choice of the patient and family. For um, this type of cancer, surgery, surgery and radiotherapy are the main treatment choices. So first, we have radiation. Radiation is given as a primary treatment for laryngeal carcinoma and sometimes used as an adjuvant therapy after surgery. It is performed in early carcinoma involving the vocal cord. So an external beam technique is utilized to administer a dose of 6,000 to 7,000 centigrade to the primary site. Next. So radiation has advantages and disadvantages. So for our advantages, it has a superior voice quality compared to surgery after the treatment. And um, the prognosis is excellent. However, the duration of treatment is long. That may last approximately six weeks. And recurrence rate is higher compared to surgical procedure. And, the, and although rare, there is a risk of having red radiation-induced malignancy. Next, please. And uh, short-term side effects that um, may last until six weeks after finishing the treatment include mucositis, adenophagia, dysphagia, skin erythema, altered edema. Long-term side effects include varying degrees of serostomia, fibrosis, and edema. And uncommon side effects are hypothyroidism, chondroradionecrosis, and osteoradionecrosis. Next, please. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Clerk Navida Kenneth Dewey, and I will be discussing surgical management of laryngeal cancers. We divided it into glotic and sub supraglotic and subdivided it into voice sparing and non-voice sparing. So for glotic carcinoma, voice sparing procedures, first is the vocal cord striping. The princip principle of this method is the removal of the vocal cord epithelium, but early vocal cord lesions are initially treated with radiation therapy. The approach for this method is in endolaryngeal by microlaryngoscopy. Next slide, please. So second is chordectomy, partial or complete. The principle of this method is removal of the tumor limited in the middle third portion of the vocal cord. The approach for this method is endolaryngeal by microlaryngoscopy with CO2 laser resection or external access via thyrotomy. Next slide, please. Next is partial laryngectomy. 
The principle of this method is, to, is the tissue resection for bilateral and advanced glotic malignancies may include resection of cartilaginous structures of the thyroid and cricoid cartilage. The approach of this method is external via thyrotomy or endolaryngeal by microlaryngoscopy with CO2 laser resection. For non-voice pairing procedure, total laryngectomy, the principle of this method is complete removal of the larynx with separation of the airway and foodway and construction of a permanent tracheostomy. Next slide, please. So for the supraglotic laryngeal carcinoma, for voice pairing procedure, first is the horizontal partial laryngectomy. The principle of this method is removal of the supraglotic larynx with the preservation of the glotic plane and arytenoid cartilages. The approach of this method is external via horizontal partial laryngectomy or endolaryngeal by microscopy with CO2 laser resection. Next slide, please. So for non-voice pairing, total laryngectomy, the principle of this method is complete removal of the larynx with separation of the airway and foodway and construction of a permanent tracheostomy. Our plan for the patient is to request an imaging study, preferably CT scan with contrast for proper staging. And biopsy will also be requested to determine the type of laryngeal carcinoma. As for the treatment, radiation or surgery can be, um, can be given depending on the TNM staging as well as the type of laryngeal carcinoma and a close follow-up. That is all, Pudok. Thank you. And here are the uh, our, our references.